Welcome to our little course in handout apologetics. In this, we hope to prove the existence of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and His Word, the Holy Scripture. So it behooves us to begin our journey with a word of prayer to Him whose existence we wish to show in this little course dedicated to His glory, shall we pray. O God of heaven and earth, how we praise Thee that Thou hast not remained hidden in Thy transcendent glory, but hath been pleased to make Thyself known, and not only known, but loved, not only loved, but served. And we pray that this little course itself may serve not only to point toward Thy existence and glory, and especially the manifestation of Thyself in Thy Son, but may bring many to know Him, whom to know is life everlasting. In His name we pray, amen. Some of you are already familiar with our handout theology and hand out church history, and will be prepared, therefore, for the format of hand out apologetics. I'll be reading these little uh, ten propositions per lecture uh, that will be printed and circulated along with the video itself. But in addition to that, unlike the other handout courses, I have written a tiny mini-apologetics as a separate work. It covers some similar material, but was independently prepared, and these lectures that you'll be listening to and seeing are in no way structured on that volume, though in a certain sense it has the advantage of giving you a kind of uniform and spelled out written book form of these lectures, which were in more uh, offhand, uh, direct communication, for which the video is so much better adapted than a book, just as a book puts the picture together in a literary form somewhat better than we can do it through this particular medium. Now, the first lecture here has to do with the meaning of apologetics and especially taking note of the attack on it. Let me say, therefore, in the first proposition that apologetics means the reasoned defense of anything, really, but in this particular case, the reasoned defense of Christianity. Or you could say the reasoned defense of Jesus Christ because Christ is Christianity. There is no Christianity apart from Him, and the story of His person and work and history is all that Christianity contains. So apologetics for us is the reasoned defense of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you please. Now, reason defense, of course, is the only really proper way to come to Jesus Christ. Most of us don't think that way, but as a matter of fact, you can't truly accept Jesus Christ if you don't understand who He is and have a reason for believing that He is God incarnate, as the Christian church professes uh, to believe. I will be showing you, if you didn't already know, that there are many people who think they can come to Christianity without any reasoning at all, and are even suspicious of any kind of Christianity that does rest on argument and proof. But if it is true, as we'll be trying to show throughout this apologetics handout study, 
that the only way to know Jesus Christ is this way, then really what we are offering you is a course in evangelism, rational evangelism, if you please. In my opinion, there isn't any other kind of evangelism except a reasonable evangelism. I don't know anybody who is going to advocate an unreasonable evangelism, though many people without advocating it nevertheless practice it, as you probably know. Secondly, before giving reasons for Christ and Christianity, I will devote four lectures, no less than four lectures, to considering reasons against giving reasons for Christianity. Literally almost a third of this course will be an attack on the course, a concentration on reasons for not giving reasons for Christianity. Admittedly, this sounds rather unreasonable itself, but it is rational, I propose, in an irrational age. And as you are aware, though we're coming out of it now, this has been called the age of the irrational man. It's interesting, it's also called the information age. may surprise you to know that some of the most noted irrationalists were the best informed of people. That is, the fact that this is the age of information and that it abounds so abundantly that we can't keep up with bibliographies doesn't mean that they're not still people who fancy that you can't really know anything. And the more information pours in, the more embarrassed they are to explain that it doesn't teach anything and that you don't learn anything by it. Now, as I say, we're coming out of the age of the irrational man, but the best that can be said for the present time is it's the morning after the night before. We're trying to recover some sobriety after a long lost intellectual weekend. The sobering up process, very slow, and many people are still suffering from the inebriation. Existentialism, which has been a dominant philosophy in our century, is quintessentially irrational and anti-rational. And while it begins in the secular world, it ultimately reaches the church, and the church is the last to be affected by it, and in a sense, the last to recover from it. The church is the last to get drunk and the last to sober up after the ordeal. That's the reason that I'm seemingly unreasonably proceeding to devote so much time in a course on the rational defense of Christianity to the reasons against reason. Ramsey wrote a book, for example, editing a 1695 work by John Locke on the reasonableness of Christianity just to register his conviction that the rational world was waking up again and becoming sober, and in order to restore itself to sobriety, he turned back to a classical work of apologetics of the late 17th uh, century. Well, in a certain smaller way, I'm endeavoring to do the same thing for the Christian church 
by showing that this anti-rationalism of this irrational age of ours is itself irrational. I'm taking some time, I admit, to justify <laughs> my seemingly unreasonable procedure, but I think you can see why I would conclude it wise to give so much time to the attack on apologetics, the better to convince you of the necessity of this subject. My third proposition is this. This is because, that is, this emphasis of mine, this dealing with the reasons against reason, is because more Christians are giving reasons against giving reasons for Christ than are giving reasons for believing. Sounds incredible, <laughs> unbelievable, unreasonable, but I assure you that's a sober statement. More Christians are giving reasons against giving reasons for Christ than are giving reasons for believing. Even now, that is true. I always remember a little experience I had a few years ago in Jackson, Mississippi, where I was speaking at a college and a seminary. And I was interviewed by the religious reporter for the Jackson Daily newspaper. He asked me for 10 minutes of my time, and he took almost two hours. Now, the reason he was uh, uh, interested, not so much in what I said as what I was, was that I believed you could prove Christianity. And he went into such a state of shock that there was a human being running around loose who thought you could prove the faith. And he just kept asking question after question after question to reassure himself that this was an encounter with reality that it took up nearly two hours. And it came over vainly, very plainly in the report in the paper that John Gerstner did actually believe you could prove Christianity and refute the attacks on it. Now, you know, Jackson, Mississippi is not exactly noted for radicalism. The Deep South is deeply conservative, and there are strong colleges maintaining the faith in Jackson and one of the best Reformed seminaries in the world. I'm sure I was not the only person in, among the quarter million inhabitants of that city who believed you could prove Christianity. But nevertheless, it seemed like an absolute novelty to this reporter who was himself a Christian, but apparently had never entertained the notion that Christianity was anything more than a preference. He happened to be a Christian, not a Jew, not a Hindu, not a Baha'i, not a Muslim. He happened to be a Christian. And here he's talking to somebody who said, you've got to be a Christian. There's no excuse for not being a Christian. You've no right to be anything other than a Christian. It was shock after shock after shock, and yet the shock is that it would be shocking that there is such a thing as a proof for the Christian religion. I didn't pass into trauma because I'd met too many people like that, but nevertheless, he's the one who's shocking, an avowed Christian who had never apparently thought there was any need whatsoever for giving a reason for his faith. But he's a typical person not I, alas. How is it with you? One thing I'm saying is that generally most Christians today are like that reporter. They think they have reasons for not needing reasons for faith. But Jesus Christ says, believe me for my work's sake. He provided evidence that he's the Son of God. He called for no 
crucifixion of the intellect, he gave overwhelming and compelling proof that he is none other than God incarnate. Now, we're following Jesus when we look for evidence and provide evidence, which he himself provided in the first instance and ask people to believe not against the evidence, but because the evidence itself is so absolutely compelling. Remember how Elijah on Mount Carmel said to the people of the Northern Kingdom, if Baal be God, worship Baal. If the Lord be God, worship the Lord. There's a prophet of God telling, a, telling the people of Israel to worship a false deity, Baal. If Baal be God, worship him as God. The evidence is in that the Lord is God, worship him. No type of person seems to annoy the deity as much as that Laodicean who is neither hot nor cold. It's almost as much as to say the Baal worshipers were less obnoxious to God than those who couldn't make up their mind whether the Lord was God or Baal was God. God is said in Revelation 3 to spew those people who are neither hot nor cold, who have no argument pro or con, who are indeterminate about the greatest issues of life. God is disposed to spit them out of his mouth. If God be God, worship him. If Baal be God, worship him. One thing is absolutely unthinkable, to be halting between two opinions. Number four, I begin in my study of reasons against reasons with Anselm's famous I believe in order to understand. Credo ut intelligam. I believe in order to understand. That's constantly quoted to mean that you begin with faith and reason follows. The evidence doesn't lead to the faith. The faith leads to the understanding. That is not what Anselm meant. Anselm was one of the finest analytical intelligences of the Middle Ages and indeed of all of Christian history. His core deus homo, why did God became a man was a carefully reasoned case for the Incarnation. His proslogion was a carefully reasoned argument for the existence of God that has gone down in history and been studied for the last millennium as the ontological argument. You can be perfectly certain this man was no intellectual cop-out. But that language of his that statement of his has been so constantly misunderstood that it is used as a reason against using reason, except in the secondary role of a servant of a belief which independently exists prior to and really apart from any evidence. Now, actually, if you interpret it that way, it's a nonsense proposition. One thing is immediately evident. You can't believe in something you don't understand. 
You've got to know what it is if you're going either to believe or disbelieve. To say, credo, I believe, and be asked, what? And answer, I don't know. It's not an act of faith, it's an act of folly. It's not evidence of trust. It's just rampant stupidity. Anselm couldn't conceivably be guilty of such nonsense as that. What he means is this. Granted that you first must know about something, and knowing something, you then, of course, accept its existence. You believe in it. And once you believe in it, then you seriously study it and come to know it. They said shortly before he died, Paul Tillich, the liberal theologian, came to believe in a personal devil. Now see, liberals generally don't believe in a personal devil. They believe that's a name, a symbol for the rampant evil in the universe, but they don't believe there is a personal devil, and consequently they don't spend any time thinking about him, believing in him, or disbelieving in him. Now, if Tillich did, as apparently he did, become convinced because there was so much evil in the world, there just had to be an evil personage behind it. You see, once he knew, as it were, that there was a devil, and of course believed, because he knew there was, that there was a devil, then he would start to become acquainted with the devil. Jonathan Edwards, for example, the great thinker of the 18th century, knew from the beginning of his intellectual odyssey there was a devil. And he wrote hundreds of pages about the devil. You see my point? Once you know there's a devil or anything, and you believe that he exists, then you are in a position to become really knowledgeable about him, understandable about him. The same thing would apply to God. If a person's really an atheist, doesn't even believe in the existence of God, he's not, of course, going to waste his time becoming familiar with a deity he doesn't believe exists. But let him once become persuaded, let him know there's a God, then he is going to become familiar with him. And I may say, though I don't have time to trace this right now, it'll figure in the apologetics later on, when we first come to know God, we're scared silly because we're accountable to him. But the point is, first the knowledge, then the faith, which brings terror until we come to know him as our Savior, as we come to understand him better and his offer of salvation and are led to embrace that salvation. But you see, this is what Anselm's talking about. You've got to know him or whatever in the first place to believe in it, but you've got to believe in God or the devil, it doesn't matter what it is, before you ever really come to understand. So far from this being hostile to the idea of apologetics, it's rudimentary and foundational uh, for it. Now the second reason for not using reason is Pascal's famous statement, the heart has reasons the mind knows not of. The heart has reasons the mind knows not of. I'm sure every one of you has heard, probably has used that statement many times. Now Pascal, like Anselm, though a 17th century figure, was also a genius of the first proportions. And I may say, he was an apologist too. And you could be perfectly certain 
whatever he meant by that expression. The heart has reasons the mind knows not of. He didn't mean to be offering reasons against reasons. We all recognize that's a profound truth. That's a reason it's become so popular and so well-known, so classical. We understand almost intuitively what the great Frenchman had in mind by that expression. But nevertheless, that statement is probably more often misunderstood than understood and abused rather than used and taken that way, so far from being profound and brilliant, it's downright stupid. The heart doesn't have any reasons. Reasons are something of the radio, of the cognitio, of the mind. The heart has desires. The heart's the heart of the matter. But one thing it lacks is reasons. Well, what does Pascal mean by saying the heart has reasons? Well, what he means is the heart has desires, but the reason you know the heart has desires is because of the reason. And these desires, if they're ever going to come into expression, they have to be justified by the mind. This is what Pascal means, that when the mind articulates certain ideas, they frequently are a justification of these desires of the heart. The heart doesn't have reasons, it has desires. The mind gives the reasons for the expression of those desires. In the Gospels, you often meet someone who answers Jesus and the record says, seeking to justify himself, he said. He has a desire to vindicate something that Jesus has criticized. So what he says is an effort to vindicate his heart. See, that's what it is so far from this meaning that the heart is more fundamental intellectually than the mind, the heart only is known by the intellectualization of the mind. And if you don't have a harmony between what's here, what's there, between the heart and the head, you have a cognitive dissonance as psychologists call it, and that cognitive dissonance drives people up the wall and sometimes over the wall into sanity. There There has to be a coordination. That's fundamentally what Pascal is mentioning. That's all we'll have time for in this first uh, lecture, but I have some more uh, well-known, some of them not so well-known, reasons for not using reasons, and I'll show you that in some cases, even those who coined these expressions never meant for a moment that these should be used as reasons against reasons, but we're pointing out something entirely different from that. The one thing we do know is that there is no valid reason for not using reason because manifestly you would then be giving reasons for not using reasons and showing that it's utterly impossible to escape reasons. And I hope you are persuaded to continue with our reasons for believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God.